Okay, the final part we're going to go over is motor skills, right? And um, again, we're going to come back to this notion of the homunculus, right? So on the right-hand side here, we see the motor homunculus, okay? So we have a, a sensory homunculus that we see on the right, left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, we have the motor hum homunculus. And here, this is Penfield's visualization where he has mapped the human cortex, that means the part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, to what parts of the human body it controls. So there's a large part um, uh, of our brain concerned with moving our lips, our jaw, and our tongue to be able to vocalize and speak, right? In fact, we have a lot more of our motor homunculus devoted to speech. Our, our tongues are not actually that sensitive, and so it's actually not as large as in the case of our motor homunculus um, in the sensory homunculus. So here we see a much smaller uh, amount of uh, surface area devoted to lips and mouth, uh, but we have a lot more of that in terms of the size for our motor abilities. Right? So again, uh, in our class, basically, we've explored two different laws to look at examples of how our motor ability is encoded, right? And basically, these are predictive laws that help us understand how we might be able to predict a person is able to carry out a task that's given by a computer system. And these are Fitts Law and the Keystroke Level Model. And I've arranged them in this uh, outline down here. And basically, this is a one way to think about it. It's that Fitts Law gives us an idea of how to point or estimate the time or difficulty of pointing at a particular object. The keystroke level model aggregates that by saying pointing is just one of several operations and that we can model all of these operations together. And then Gomes and Hick Hyman's Law, uh, which we'll look at in the cognitive uh, model part of our lecture today, uh, talks about uh, how to structure these in the higher level cognitive sense. We're going to review these later, and we're going to cover these two now. So Fitts Law, we've already seen, right? It's a model for how uh, predicting how long it would take to complete a pointing action, right? And we've seen it over here on the left-hand side. Uh, meaning that if I have this arrow and I have this uh, thing here, uh, the, uh, the time that's going to take to locate the pointer into this box is going to be a ratio of the distance between here and here. This is the D and the width of the target, right? The blue box is the width of the target here. The larger the ratio, the longer it takes. So if this arrow is much farther away or this box was much narrower in width, it would be much more difficult to hit that target. Okay, And what we want to remember is that this ratio stays constant. So if we enlarge this diagram as twice as big, it's going to, uh, Fitts Law is going to predict that it's going to take the same amount of time to point to this. Okay, Because the ratio between the distance covered and the width of the target remain the same. Okay, When we look at Fitts Law, uh, there are some uh, difficulties with applying it, as uh, the team who presented Fitts Law and Hick Hyman's Law talked about. Right? First, it's a one-dimensional measure that doesn't make uh, account for the depth or height of a target. So imagine if you're trying to point to something in 2D space, like the two buttons that we saw before. But imagine these buttons are very, very... Uh, shallow, right? Let's say they're they're very small in height, so they're basically coin size, uh, um, pro a profile of a coin sized uh, target. Then, even though the width might be very large, you have to locate it uh, also on the y axis, okay? And Fitts Law doesn't automatically account for that, right? If we're thinking about a 3D space, then you would also need to account for depth, okay? And because of Fitts Law, people have decided, ACI designers, that have tried to look at ways of minimizing that, so to create the ratio that's going to be much smaller and much easier to find. So, for example, since distance is a large factor, people have uh, developed pie menus, right? These are menus that are centered around the pointer that make it fairly easy to have a large target area 
within a small amount of distance to choose options. Okay, so I'd like you to do some thinking on your own when revising this lecture. Okay, think about when it's appropriate to use Fitts Law and what modifications you would have to make to Fitts Law for other scenarios that we might uh, come across where there are pointing actions. Okay, the keystroke level model is the final thing that we're going to look at. Basically, the keystroke uh, level model puts together many different types of operations, including pointing operations, into a series of operations, right? And we're basically just going to sum up all of these operators to give a final time estimate. To find out how long it takes to complete a task, basically we have to take all the task operations and put them into this keystroke level uh, granularity. Okay, so we have to define all the atomic moves that a person must have to do to do that operation, and then we're going to have estimates for each of these tasks and sum them all together to get a final total. And this was presented by the keystroke level model and GOMS team. Okay, where they showed us an example of someone trying to replace a word in a Microsoft document. So first you have to reach for the mouse. This is the H operator or home to the mouse. Okay, and uh, we might give the same uh, timing for homing to the mouse in different uh, times, right? So let's say you move to the mouse at this point, it's going to take you almost half a second. You move to the mouse at this point, it's going to take you half a second as well. And if you move from the mouse to the keyboard, it might also take you some amount of time. So all of these homing operations are indicated in green here. Right, color coded by the team who did the presentation. Okay, then we have a point operation, point to the menu item. Here we're given a constant time p to point to a menu item, or p to point to a few, or p to replace all. That's a particular menu operation. Is all going to be 1.1? But we can refine this estimate by applying Fitts law. Okay, so Fitts law is implicitly, in some ways, could be embedded inside the keystroke level model. The keystroke level model just says, I'm just going to define a set of times for each type of operation and not consider the variability within the time. Okay, so we have all of these different types of things that we have to do. Clicking or typing a, a particular stroke, pressing a button is indicated by K here. So if we click on the uh, replace command, that's a K for a mouse, or click on four keys, that's what would be four times the K operator here. Okay? So basically we have all of these different colors of operations. I'm going to sum up all the times to give us a measure of how many how much time it would take to finish this operation. So here it says it would take about 10.2 seconds to finish doing the operation of uh, typing in uh, and replacing all of the four letter words with another four letter Okay, and at this point, basically, we're done with our lecture on human abilities. And for you to think about, again, is to how to think about which models we discussed, okay, and how they would apply to different platforms. So we are talking largely in the 80s and 90s about desktop uh, applications that come at personal workstations. But now that our computing devices are no longer bound to the desktop, we have to do some thinking about whether these models still apply and how they might be adapted. Okay? And secondly, how can we apply these varying types of perception that we have to best support HCI? So earlier we talked about using one modality or one channel to give information and using a secondary channel to support or give reinforcing or complementary information. And we saw that again in um, the Fitz Law group who presented Giard's model of bimanual skills, saying that we have basically one primary hand which we use to do fine motor control, right? So we might write with one hand and we might use our secondary hand uh, to support or frame uh, the reference for our primary hand's work. So that might apply not just to memory, not just to attention, but also to different types of perception, visual, audio, haptic and others, and I'd like you to think about that.